I have this little notebook of ideas for future things to talk about, and on this page, written, giant, massive, bold letters, shower palette. I don't get it. Why would I write shower palette? What does that even mean? Jelly, take a look at this. Shower palette. Here, take a gander. You're good at being smart. Shower palette. The phrase shower palette has many different implications, because neither the word shower or palette have one singular definition. For example, the word shower, is it referring to the act of taking a shower? as in stepping in a porcelain tomb and encasing oneself in water through a direct stream? In that case, maybe I wrote this down while in the shower, and just thinking about shower things, which is incredibly unlikely considering the non creakliness of the paper. The other definition of shower is, like, showering someone with something. Not necessarily water, so I guess it's the same definition, but like showering someone with gifts, or showering someone with a palette. Palette of art, as in a color palette. Bathing in paint. Painting oneself also has many different definitions. For example, you can talk about physically painting oneself, as in taking paint and putting it on yourself. This is a more temporary art form, unless we're talking tattoos, but I'm not. Because palette indicates paint, not ink. Although I guess ink also has its own palette, but let's pretend it doesn't, for demonstrative purposes. Painting one's own self could be for, like, Halloween, or for a green screen, or for a more artsy purpose, like that guy in that one song with the xylophone that goes do 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 Yeah, that one. But painting oneself does not necessarily have to be one's body, or slightly under one's body, in the case of tattooing. Because there's also self-portraits, a way of expressing oneself. Such as Pablo Picasso, whose self-portrait grew increasingly more abstract, as he became more and more comfortable with his own art style. Or Frida Kahlo, who includes animals in her self-portrait. I'm sure there's some sort of deep psychological meaning an emotional connection to these animals. But if you're not aware of that, it's also just fun to see animals. But hey, palette does not just mean color palette, or artistic palette, or that white plastic mixy thing that artists use. I think that's also called a palette. For example, palette can also mean the top part of your mouth. So it's pretty much the opposite of the jaw. It's the jaw part of your mouth that's attached to your skull. Although I'm not sure what that has to do with the shower. Perhaps eating the shower water? But no, not even I'm dumb enough to do that. It just seems like a bad idea. I don't know where that water's been. Perhaps I accidentally had installed a shower that cleans water from the shower it's currently being taken in, and I'm just drinking my own water. Gross. Palette, despite its most popular definition being about paint, also has a second mouth-related synonym. It also means the type of food that you like to eat, although I'm not sure how that relates to showers, as there's no chocolate sauce in the shower. And if there was, it does not work like shampoo, or conditioner, or normal soap, or any kind of Frankensteinian combination of those. Surely it couldn't be shower palette, as an edible palette, because the only things that are eaten in the shower are sometimes soap on accident, sometimes shower water on accident, and your own saliva. And I'm not too confident that even I could come up with a three minute rant on saliva. But no, wait, what if I was very tired when I wrote it? Maybe I switched the letters, maybe it's supposed to be power shallot, as in a super powerful onion, like a superhero onion, or a strong onions, onions make you cry, crying is like water, water is in showers. Hey, I figured it out. Yeah, okay, maybe it's not that. Maybe shower palette is meant to be taken literally, as in the different kinds of showers that are and can be taken. For example, long showers, short showers, cold showers, warm showers, and those are about all the showers I can think of. For example, one may take a short shower when they have to get to work, like a power shallot would, because plants drown if they're in water too long, and obviously, if a shallot's powerful, it's gotta go shallot somewhere and show it off. Someone may take a long shower if they're interested in being clean. Also something that a powerful shallot would definitely want to do. Because with great power comes being clean. I think that's a quote from Batman. Someone might take a cold shower, if they're a weirdo who likes that. And someone might take a hot shower, if they're a weirdo who likes that. I myself prefer intermediate temperatures. So maybe power shallot was implying the differences between Kelvin, Fahrenheit, and Celsius. Here, I can do that in five seconds. Fahrenheit is the one used in the United States of America. Celsius is the one used everywhere else, and Kelvin is the one used in science. But that's not all there is when involved in temperature. Maybe the power shallots and the shower pellets can combine together. Maybe I was trying to find out the perfect water temperature in growing the biggest onion. What am I doing? Jelly, I think we should just call it a night. There are some mysteries that are not worth solving. I'm sorry for getting you involved in this. It's like a wild goose chase, but with backwards onions. This has been Billy Nut Joe's Rant, and I hope you enjoyed. Good night, Jelly. Hello, 
welcome to Build Nacho's Rant. Today I'd like to discuss... Hello, and unfortunately I had to pull you from that previous program, as it did suck. My name is Ultraviolet, and as I'm sure you're very aware, the month of June is recognized as Pride Month, involving those who are LGBTQ plus or otherwise. In celebration of those involved or supportive of that initialism, I would like to take a moment of your time to talk about self-expression. Of course, involving giant robots. Now, of course, I understand that not everyone has the privilege of having the money to afford giant robot construction projects. So, as a budget option, one can consider harnessing your art skills in order to draw one of the many colorful flags. Yeah, I didn't have any pink or blue, but I, I did have red. You can also consider building your own robot out of Lego, although be warned it is just as expensive as building the real thing. Before you begin work on your project, it is good to get your DCWs in order. Design, construct, weaponize. Understanding these three points, and learning from my mistakes, will get your killer robot finished in no time. Designing is easily the most fun part, as you can pretty much do whatever you want and have no consequences because you haven't started yet. For example, giant robots, unfortunately, tend to be on the heavier side, so in order to move that giant mass along quicker, it can be smart to attach a giant jetpack to the back and have it be able to move in multiple directions for fast going, no matter where you're facing. And sure, a jetpack may be good for going over to the grocery store to buy produce, but what a giant robot really needs is a laser reflection chamber so that it can cast massive beams of heat, incinerating anything in its path. Add a couple finishing touches for intimidation, and there you go. You have your own very giant robot. But a very giant robot requires a very giant amount of materials to create. Although it would seem like a good idea to build a smaller robot to help in the construction of the larger one, in my experience, it is absolutely not worth the effort. My general rule is, if the robot somehow becomes intelligent enough to start taking credit from you, it's probably time to pull the plug. However, a failure is not a failure if you don't make the same mistake twice. My new favorite strategy in terms of construction is just having a nice lay down and building things peacefully. Because after all, you're not building for someone else, you're building for you. Now that covers design and construction, but what about weaponry? The second most fun aspect. Well, if you have the right pieces, you can pretty much turn anything into a weapon. Although the average person will not be able to construct this by themselves, this right here is my prototype for a new transcontinental railgun. Not only is it a double pun, but it's a double pun with infinite effective range. <laughs> Chuck and I have been discussing some ways to attach this thing to the robot, but every time we try it, it just ends up blowing off its own arms. So it's a work in progress, but I'm sure we'll get it eventually. I very much so want to fire this thing from my hands, but unfortunately that would kill me and everyone in the surrounding area. So maybe not a good idea. However, if there is one thing to retain from this, one thing that you remember, remember this, my biggest regret. Robots, under no circumstance, are a replacement for friends. Robots are capable of minimal things, destroying, creating, and traveling. Friends are capable of that and much, much more. So I say absolutely under no circumstance should you choose a lifeless piece of metal and plastic over your loved ones. You will regret it. I love you, Chuck. Oh yeah, this is nice. This is, this is really great. I suppose by this point you want to go back to watching your normal show, so I will just quickly switch this over for you, and um, have a nice day, and please do not tell anyone else about this, as I would still like to keep some secrets. So that's how I would reorder the calendar. This has been Billy Net Joe's Rant, and I hope you enjoyed. You know, it felt like less people were listening this time. I don't know that that's just a psychological thing, or if I'm doing something wrong. It's probably nothing. <laughs> Hello, welcome to Billy Nutjo's Rant, and I like variety. I like to talk about many different subjects. It just so happens that sometimes a subject that I talk about today is quite similar to the subject I talked about last time. Last time I discussed the common misconception that there are only three states of matter, and today I'm going to discuss what I think is a more important misconception. Let's start with a question. What is the worst name for an animal? And I don't mean a funny name that may have a double meaning. And I'm not even talking about an inappropriate name and the fact that it doesn't quite make much sense. For example, red panda or guinea pig. I think I may have found it. The worst name for an animal. And also the animal that's probably the most misunderstood. The blobfish. If you've never heard of a blobfish before, go. Go look it up right now. Go look up a picture of a blobfish. I'll wait.
B L O B space F I S H. Enter. Give you a few seconds. Look at the first few results. See, it's pink, sort of blobular, like Jello. There's some liquid oozing out of its mouth. Yeah, you can see it. Quite easy to understand how this animal has gotten the reputation as the world's ugliest animal. Okay, come back to this tab now. So yeah, what's the problem? It's an ugly fish. Not much more to say, is there? Well, what if I were to tell you that that fish is not actually ugly? It's not even a blob. It should really just be called fish. Because the reason the blobfish looks like that is because it lives very deep in the water, with a lot of pressure on it. And as it is taken up to the surface for scientific examination, the pressure, change, crushes its body and turns it into a blob. So yes, blobfish are blobs when they die. Yes, the reason this creature looks like that is because it has a very poor skeletal and muscular system. So it can't support its own weight outside of those intense pressures. We've been laughing at a corpse. I feel so bad. It's not your fault you look like that blobfish. We killed you. It's so upsetting that this thing is the number one ugliest animal in the world. Why? Oh, you stupid fish. You should go get a less ugly corpse. In their normal environment, blobfish just look like any other fish. About as ugly as a normal fish. Which isn't to say they look particularly good, but not top 10 worst animals of all time. It's not even like this is just a non-scientific, sort of casual way of addressing this creature like, ha, look at you, you goofy blobfish, you big squidward nosed blobfish. Uh -huh, uh -huh. No, this is the actual scientific name. Actual scientists give this thing the name blobfish, even though they know it only looks like a blobfish when it's crushed. Just like how anyone else would look like that if they were crushed, I'm sure. Well, of course, there's always the gobbledygook scientific name for every animal, but no one really addresses them by those. That would be like if a paleontologist dug up a dinosaur and said, hmm, yes, the Skelosaurus. Hmm, I wonder why all these old animals were all just made of bones. When did animals start growing skin and stuff? It still perplexes us to this day. But you see, really, the problem with this isn't the scientist who named it, or the actual creature itself. No, the problem is that one stupid picture that everyone knows the blobfish for. You know, the one you probably saw as the, one of the first results when searching blobfish up. Yeah, the one against the black background where it's on like a gray towel, and it has that gross little thing on the corner of its mouth, which apparently is a parasite, which is actually a very interesting topic. I might talk about that in a future rant, you know, like tongue-eating louses. But anyway, that photo has sent the poor blobfish's reputation down the gutter. There's no recovering from it. Everyone already assumes that you look like that, Mr. Blobfish. And unless these people were to take a submarine all the way down to the bottom of the ocean of Australia, thousands of miles under the sea, no one's going to believe that you don't look like that. It's quite unfortunate. But hey, there are also people who appreciate the blobfish for its unexistent ugliness. Which is also very nice. Although it is still kind of strange looking at all that cute artwork of blobfishes when they're, those are really just a bunch of smiling corpses, but whatever. Zombie fish. Zombies are cool. Yeah. In a way, blobfish are sort of reverse pufferfish. Because pufferfish, in order to inflate themselves, drink a whole bunch of the water and absorb it through their mouth to create a spiky force field. Meanwhile, blobfish completely unintentionally, when they are pulled up to the surface, just sort of deflate. No defensive maneuvers. In fact, it's pretty much a self-destruction. Because I doubt throwing a blobfish back in the ocean will have it sink down in time enough before it gets all, like, mushy. A blobfish smoothie. Put that in your seafood restaurant menus. Actually, on second thought, don't. Ignore that previous quip, as blobfish are apparently endangered. Which you wouldn't know if you just searched up are blobfish endangered on Google right now, because it would just say, not extinct. Oh boy, they're not extinct. What's their actual endangerment status? I don't know, but at least they're not extinct. So yeah, I just wanted to bring up the physical status of the blobfish for June. The month of love. Second only to the actual month of love, February. But you know, blobfish deserve love too. Actually, no. Blobfish don't, because they're not alive. But fish fish blobfish do. So yeah, yay! Go blobfish! Book a flight to Australia. Get some scuba gear and a submarine. Or if you're lazy, just head on over to a, a museum or a an aquarium or something. Go watch an episode of Wild Kratts. I'm sure they have an episode on blobfish. Activate blobfish power! <laughs>
And I'm not saying that as an editorial opinion-based thing. I'm saying that factually. AI is just a big math equation. It doesn't have intelligence. It's stupid. It believes what you tell it. The I part of AI is just a flashy thing because it's 99% A. Meanwhile, teachers are individuals who have something called a brain that can function not like an algorithm. In some ways worse than an algorithm in the fact that it can't remember infinite things, but in other ways better than an algorithm because it's not just some beeps and boops and numbers. There's a person in there and all those electrodes. With that being said, that may clear some things up on my opinion on AI, but just in case, I'll dim some things down. I'm not a fan of AI. I get harassed by one almost every week. It's annoying. And while that sort of AI is vastly different than a chat AI that you can actually talk to in typing form, not in physical contact form, I'm not exactly sure how that technology works, but I am quite sure of how a chat bot works. Okay, not really. I actually have no idea how it works. But I know it definitely needs user input in order to quote-unquote learn things. Mainly just remember something that someone said so that if someone happens to ask a similar question later, then it can just recycle the same answer. For example, hey Billy, I am posing as the chatbot and the chatter in this example. What color is the sky? Hmm. Well, in order to ask that question, I'll have to remember the last time I looked at the sky. Hmm. That was about four months ago. And last time I did that, it was quite rainy, so I'd like to say the sky is gray. Now this is the point where the user could correct the chatbot. Say, uh, no, you stupid idiot. Actually, the sky is blue most of the time. It's just the clouds are gray, so they cover the sky. To which the AI would probably respond in some cheeky way, like, oh yes, I understand now. Thank you for improving my neural networks or something. Or, and this, this is the preferable thing, you don't correct the AI and don't feed into its stupidity. And instead, let it be stupid on itself, because if it's really intelligent, then it would know when it's wrong. But it's just artificial intelligence, so it doesn't know. So why would you waste your actual intelligence in helping this foolish creature thrive any further? This is survival of the fittest, and you're a few million years too late, robots. Now, coming from me, that might seem a bit out of character and harsh. And I know. I love things. I love love. But I don't love robots. I don't like chat box. I don't like tenor bots. I don't like botany. I don't want to be bullied by lower life forms. If I cut myself on the rose, at least the rose knows that it's not its fault because it doesn't pretend to have intelligence. It just doesn't have intelligence. So why can't robots be the same? Now, I may not be an artificial intelligence sympathizer or synthesizer, as I'm sure they like to be called because they just love to mimic things in an alternative way. There are also some good things that these chatbots have done. Like, for example, AI art. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Did I just say that AI art was good? I meant it was the dumbest and worst decision that anyone on the AI creation team could have ever possibly made. Why would you allow it to do art? The whole point of art, the reason why a banana taped to a wall can be art, is because it expresses some emotion. Robots cannot express emotion. They can discuss hatred of rodent, but not emotion. Hatred might be an emotion, it's a synthetic emotion. A synthetic emotion towards me, so I don't like it. To call back to what I just said, that banana taped to the wall, called comedian, for I'm sure a purpose, was exactly that, put there for a purpose. A purpose of making people think things. Most of those things just be thinking, why did you tape a banana to a wall in this art exhibition? But things nonetheless. And while an AI art may invoke some emotions and may make you think things, these things were not on purpose. They are done by an algorithm to attempt to create an art. But what it really created was something that looks like an art, but doesn't. it doesn't have, you know, the feel of an art, if you understand what I'm saying. Not in the same way that comedian does, Although it's certainly a lot less pretentious than taping a banana to a wall. But we're not here to discuss the validity of taping bananas to walls. Because while I may appreciate art from the side, I'm no artistic scientist. But I mean, if Wikipedia lists your mediums as banana and duct tape, I'm not exactly sure that can be considered high effort. But honestly, it's a lot more high effort than just typing in a prompt in some program and it producing a whole mass of pixels that resemble something somewhat. And if I'm going to be artist, I mean honest, you know what, let's just keep that mistake in. It fits. I much preferred the earlier days of AI art in the form of AI-generated images, which would generate some of the most nightmarish, twisted, and horrific things I've ever seen. But hey, they'd look a whole lot cooler than just trying to steal someone's art style in the form of an artificial intelligence. And honestly, some of those primitive, weird amalgamations are far more thought-provoking and interesting than whatever current AI art is being produced. And I'm not saying, oh, back in my day, AI art was so much better. Because no, 
It was always terrible. It was just terrible in a lot more of an intriguing way a few months ago. Or maybe a few years ago. I don't know. When was AI started? On second thought, the ability for an AI to create art isn't bad. In fact, I'd say it's a technological marvel. The problem is, when people then ask an AI to create an art, and then pretend like it's an actual art that a real person made. Because no, it's not. Think about it this way. If you had a child who was really good at art, and they drew something really interesting, would you pass it off as your own? No, you'd thank your robot child, and label it as such. Robot child painting by AI 704B171492. Yeah, really, it wasn't always like this. I didn't always hate AI-generated images. For example, this right here was my first ever exposure to an AI-generated image. I didn't know it was one until long after, but now looking back, it's pretty obvious to see that this wasn't created by someone with a brain. This, uh, masterpiece is often accompanied with the title, Can you name one thing in this photo? Which is a simple question, really, and you'd think it'd have a simple answer, but it doesn't really, because I can't for the life of me decipher what the heck is happening. And, fair warning, if you don't like things that look incorrect or Honestly, I'd say this is pretty distressing. Close your eyes right now, and uh, I'll tell you when to open them. But I mean, this isn't really that bad. There's nothing humanoid that I can tell. It's just a bunch of objects. It's a messy room, but a messy room cobbled together by someone who doesn't know what people things look like. An AI. Really, this image makes me understand the appeal of AI, because sometimes it can create really interesting things. Like, for example, me and Jelly, earlier today, we were talking about what looks like this little rodent guy. Look at him. He's adorable. His little droopy face. He's hanging upside down from that pile of whatever. Aw, he's so me. I love little rodent guy. I know it's not a rodent, but it looks like one. And that's all that matters. See what I was talking about earlier from extrapolating meaning where there is none? Yeah, this rodent means nothing, but he means the world to me. I love you, AI rodent. Alright, you can open your eyes now if they were closed. I'm sorry you missed out on that demented hamster. But hey, you win some, you lose some, and you can always rewind the video. Assuming you're not watching this on Scratch. And honestly, if I were to give one tip, on how AI could not affect you, since it's based on neural networks and other people giving information. Simply, don't be a super popular celebrity person. Yeah, that's how you avoid being taken over by AI in a theoretical future where that happens. They're gonna have to write a new Terminator movie, where the Terminators can only terminate things that have previously been submitted to chatbots. In which case, that would be pretty good, because the Terminators would just terminate homework. This has been Billy Nutjo's rant, and if you're watching this and not a robot, I love you, and I hope you enjoyed. Okay, Jelly, this topic I'm about to talk about is gonna be cool. This is a big one. Is it as big as the Doom Square one, which actually, you know, helped a community of people? No, but it's certainly a lot more fun than that. Plants vs. Zombies. It's a game that needs no introduction. It's a classic that has about a bajillion sequels, and each one of those sequels has expanded and retconned on its own lore. And I'm not here to talk about the entire Plants vs. Zombies expansive lore history, because if I'm gonna be honest, I don't know the entire Plants vs. Zombies expansive lore history, but I am quite familiar with a few of the games. One of those games being the first Plants vs. Zombies. It had a very humble beginning. A simple game. And a simple game that re didn't really have much of a story. There are zombies, and you have magic plants that shoot giant vegetables. But what if I were to tell you that there's actually some environmental storytelling going on that I haven't seen anyone be talking about? Sorry, Jelly, but you're gonna have to do some graphics work for this one, because such environmental storytelling requires a view of the environment. Here is what the player's house in Plants vs. Zombies looks like. But before we start talking about storytelling, we need to talk about the characters in the game. There are three of them, one of them being the player, and this is the player's house, as you can see. I mean, of course it is. Who else's house are we defending? This is quite literally an eat-or-be-eaten situation. The other two characters are a man named Crazy Dave, who is the player's supposed neighbor, and who helps out by selling special seeds from the back of his car. It sounds incredibly suspicious now that I say it without context, but trust me, they're not drugs. They're cat heads mounted on lily pads. And the third character is my favorite, really just because his name is a portmanteau, and you know how I love portmanteaus, Zomboss, a portmanteau of zombie and boss, and I'm sure you can imagine what his role is. After enlightening those who are not familiar with the characters of Plants vs. Zombies, let us now not talk about those characters, and instead discuss a different question. Where did these zombies come from? I mean, you'd think it would be explained in the game, but it's really not. Obviously, this Zomboss guy is in charge of them, so he must have been the person who created them. Well, then why is he a zombie? I don't know, but luckily, the game presents us with some little tidbits that may help us find out. For example, in the Plants vs. Zombies Official Guide to Protecting Your Brains book, 
it says that zombies have existed since the dawn of time. Uh, no, that doesn't make sense. That can't be canon. Because otherwise, why is the player freaking out now that they have to protect their lawn from zombies? If the player is old enough to have bought a house and who has been on this planet for probably, I'd say, like, 20 years. So you'd think he'd know about the zombies. So yeah, while this book, while funny, does not provide accurate Plants vs. Zombies lore. However, just by looking at the actual front yard, we get a little glimpse at where the zombies may have came from. If you look at that sewer grate to the right on the street, you can see a green goop radiating from inside it. So maybe the zombie virus was spread through the water. Which brings up another question as to how the plants can grow without water, but they seemingly grow instantly after being planted, so I guess they don't need water. But then there's also that garden hose in the front of the house that seems to be unaffected, and there's also the zen garden mode where you actually do water plants, but maybe they bought that water from the store? A store that didn't have zombies? You know what, I'm overthinking this. Maybe the green glow is just from some regular uranium in the sewer system and doesn't actually have anything to do with zombies. Okay then, moving on to the night levels, we can see that not only is that sewer grate still glowing with that mysterious green sludge, the other sewer grate is now glowing. Perhaps it was always glowing, but we just couldn't tell in daylight. So while I'm not entirely sure what that is, there is another bit of lore revealed. See that house in the distance? Look, a house that has its lights on. This is the only other house that has its lights on in the entire game. Well, not really, but we'll get to that in a few seconds. Could this be Crazy Dave's house? But wait, there's more. If you look at the backyard, you can see a pool that's been freshly filled with water, which further disclaims my zombie from water theory. Although zombies do inexplicably rise from the pool at huge waves covered in kelp. So maybe that theory still holds water? <laughs> holds water. But anyway, see that other house in the distance? There are two houses in the distance. One that has its lights on and one doesn't. So, is Crazy Dave's house the one from the front yard view or the backyard view? My theory is that it's in the backyard view because Crazy Dave doesn't allow access to his shop until the zombies have already started attacking your backyard. So maybe he thought, oh, the zombies will just stay on that side of the street. I'll be perfectly fine. Uh-oh, the zombies are attacking, and this guy seems to know how to plant plants to not get eaten. So I should alliance with him. Because Crazy Dave, despite the name, is actually a very intelligent individual. So that's my theory. In a desperate act of self-preservation, Dave invites you to his secret supply of secret seeds that he keeps in his van. Only after the zombies start attacking near his house, which would be that house. And you can also see what may appear to be two extra house lights in the very far background. But those houses are so far away, I wouldn't exactly qualify those people who live there as neighbors. Maybe they're just fellow survivors. So okay, big whoop. You may have came up with a theory on where Crazy Dave from Plants vs. Zombies lives in relation to the player's house. Who cares? Well, now to move on to the most mysterious level in Plants vs. Zombies. The final act, Roof. Now in-game, the Cabbage Pulse description describes how confused it is that the zombies got it to the roof. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. How could these things possibly get to the roof? I'll give the Cabbage Pulse the benefit of the doubt and maybe the fact that it couldn't see it from the left side of the roof, but there's quite obviously a ladder leaning on the roof that the zombies can just climb up. Now how the Catapult zombies got their catapults and the Zombonis got their ice polishers up there, that may be worth looking into. What's also worth looking into is the fact that the Zombonis do not appear in Plants vs. Zombies 2 for some reason, even though they would be pretty cool. They're one of the most unique zombies. Why? Well, I assume legal troubles with Zamboni, the actual company that the zombies are parodying. But why couldn't they have just called it Ice Polisher Zombie? Anyway, back on subject. Despite what a big deal the game makes about how the zombies got on the roof, that's not the question I'm asking. What I'm asking is something that's been in plain sight this entire time that I've seen no one on the entire internet talk about. And I know I don't do the most thorough research, but you know, I looked up Strange Thing on PVZ Roof, and nobody was talking about it. So let's talk about it. I'm of course talking about these little flowers going on the top of the roof. Aw, oh, they're adorable. Little daisies sprouting out from the roof. It's fitting, really, that a game about plants and zombies would have plants on the roof. Look how cute they are. Okay, that's not actually the shocking thing that I was talking about. But I've noticed those flowers on the roof far before I noticed this other thing that I will reveal right... This! This is the thing that's been bothering me. If you don't know why this has been bothering me, you most likely haven't played the more recent games. And honestly, I haven't either. But I know that when I see it. That is the color palette of a Dr. Zomboss invention. Meaning that the player has had a zombie beacon on their house the entire time. Or at least I assume that's what it is. It sure isn't a satellite TV dish. Those are Zomboss's iconic yellow and purple color palette that he uses for a lot of his inventions. So this would explain why all the zombies seem to just be attacking your house. In their descriptions, it mentions where they got all their items, like how the screen door zombie stole a screen door from someone else's house. But that was before. Now, all the zombies seem to just be attacking this one house. 
And why this one house? Well, because this is the only house on the block that has a Z-Tech beacon on it. How has no one noticed this? You could say, well, considering this game existed before the Z-Tech thing existed, maybe it's just a coincidence. But then tell me, why is everything else in this game realistically colored in the background, except for this one dish? It just doesn't add up. It's so obvious, it sticks out like a sore thumb, and yet it's flown quite literally under the radar for all these years. And if my following theory is correct, then this is truly some fourth dimensional storytelling. Perhaps Zambas, being the super genius inventor guy, actually made a brand of satellite TV dishes that he sold all over the area to better attract his zombie minions. I mean, it would make sense. If you have a lot of money, might as well treat yourself to something other than a giant robot. So my final theory of where did the zombies from Plants vs. Zombies come from is that Dr. Zomboss, under his actual name, Edgar George, because obviously just calling yourself Zomboss would be a dead giveaway, sold these satellite dishes all across the area. And then awakened the dead. And obviously all the zombies flocked to this house first, after preparing all their armaments and screen doors and buckets and whatnot. Because this house is actually built right next to a graveyard. And you couldn't see it during the nighttime graphics, because I assume it's a separate entity in the game, so it wouldn't be included in just the background. But during nighttime, there are headstones to the right of the house. So this house is built next to a graveyard. And also during the loading screen, it shows the house being next to a graveyard. So all the zombies flock to this house first, and that's why the player is in such deep trouble with these zombies. Is it a perfect theory? No. But it's the only theory anyone's ever giving, so I think it's a good starting point. As for the radioactive stuff in the sewers, um... Maybe Zombas poisoned the water so people would be forced out of their houses and into the zombie horde? I don't know, doesn't seem too far-fetched. And of course it wouldn't be a conversation about Plants vs. Zombies things that don't add up without mentioning Zombas' giant robot. You know, the one that somehow stands on the house despite being humongous and would absolutely cave in the roof. But hey, everyone said it. No one ever asked how he just reaches down and places down a Zomboni or a Gargantuan, because who cares? He just pulls it from his zombie spawning vats. But I mean, viewing the durability of the Zombot Maybe it doesn't actually weigh that much. It may be big, but it's also destroyed by cabbages, kernel pulse, and watermelon. Yes, this giant machine is destroyed by actual tiny pieces of corn being thrown at it. I mean, I can somewhat understand a rotting, decayed corpse being killed by a watermelon, but a giant robot? I mean, it's not even like you kill Zomboss. He survives. He just surrenders. It's the robot that's destroyed from watermelon. You'd think getting hit in the forehead with a watermelon would hurt more th from a person than for a robot. But I guess not. So yeah, Plants vs. Zombies, cool game, would recommend, very fun. I kind of wish there was a fast-forward button like in Plants vs. Zombies 2, but hey, what are you going to do? I like that the game has all these sort of fun, hidden little details that may not actually be hidden little details, but they can be interpreted as such by a curious gamer such as myself. And the thing that I'm pretty sure almost everyone knows is just the pure funness of the zombies' animations. Some zombies just do a normal idle during the Choose Your Seeds part. Some zombies bob back and forth. Some zombies have their tongues out. Some zombies walk faster than others. Some zombies die by falling down with one arm forward. Some zombies die by falling down with one leg curled up. And all zombies, for some reason, have a twisted ankle. That's probably why they move slow as molasses. This has been Billy Nacho's Rant, and I hope you enjoyed. Protect your brains! Hello, welcome to Billy Nacho's Rant. And unfortunately, it is raining today. Like, really raining. Like, it's June. I thought April showers brought May flowers, not June monsoons send me to the tomb. Standing out there is like standing in a bullet storm. It feels like you're being shot, but not really, because it doesn't actually hurt. It's more of a tickle, an aggressive tickle, the worst kind of tickle. And seeing as it is raining quite heavily, we are indoor bound, which is to say no standing in the park today, which is unfortunate because standing on the park is one of my top 10 favorite activities. The other nine will be reserved for another time, maybe. So, hmm, let's think of some indoor activities that I could talk about. Well, I mainly only stay inside, when I'm eating and sleeping. Hmm. Well, I've already covered eating extensively on multiple different occasions, so that would be quite redundant. However, sleeping is an untouched subject, unlike other things like video games or various science or art or scratch. And speaking of scratch, wow, it's raining so hard outside that the floor is quaking beneath us. That's the reason. It's not an issue related with scratch jank and sprite size. And, you know what, just as a bonus for any friends out there watching who don't happen to like constantly warping textures, let's just uh, cover that up real quick. Weird, now it feels like a comedy club in here. What's the deal with Doom Squares? Alright, so, sleep is not necessarily as touched upon a subject as some others, but I've still somewhat talked about sleep before. Like that one time I talked about REM cycles. Do 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 do
So how about we talk about the physical aspects of sleeping, not necessarily the internal processing part. Mainly, the direction that one faces while sleeping. What side do you lay on? How about you, Jelly? On your left, I can definitely see the appeal of sleeping on one side, because it gives you a perfect blind view of whatever side of the bed you're looking at. Be that you're looking at a wall, or one side of your room, that happens to be nicer than the other side. So the first thing you see when you wake up is something nice and optimistic. I personally prefer sleeping on my back, because that way I get a nice view of the ceiling. And it's also the most ready position, like a predator waiting to pounce. Because if you need to get up really quickly, all you have to do is put your legs in the air and pump forward. And the propulsion from that pump should push you off the bed. The only other position besides right side, which is pretty much the same as left side, just depends on where your bed is positioned. And it's also probably like toilets, where what side of the globe you're on. But whatever. The last position that one could possibly sleep in, besides standing, or, oh boy, head standing, which are both advanced tactics and not recommended by myself, is sleeping on your face. And I can somewhat understand the appeal of sleeping on your face, because it gives your face covered in the nice pillow. But at the same time, the bad part is that it covers your face with the pillow, so it just seems like the most dangerous option. Plus, what if you accidentally apply suction with your lips a bit too much in your sleep, and then you just have a mouthful of saliva in the morning? Gross. No thanks. And of course, there's a handy sleep tip that pretty much everyone knows by, like, elementary school, and that is, if you flip your pillow over, then that side will be cooler than the other side. And this is actually a real thing, and explained through the scientific concept of convection, which I am not a guru on, because I'm not that into thermodynamics. Personally, I don't think air is all that interesting. But yeah, warm air disperses the cold air, and I guess it just so happens to be dispersed to the other side of the pillow. Bonus points if it's not a fluffy pillow, but rather a silky smooth pillow. Those are always the funnest kinds of pillows. The details of that explanation may not be correct, but neither of us are that into air, so just know that there's science backing your pillow flipping. It's not a weird thing. Everyone does it. Now, flipping your pillow because one side of the pillow got all sweaty, because you were laying your sweaty head in the middle of the summer, is an entirely less scientific concept. In this case, it's almost better to flip the pillow, or at the very least, let it dry out on like a rack or something. Maybe even sleep on the rack. Practice your horse standing sleeping position. Unrelated note, but I've always found it sort of humorous that a school year is hardly consistent with the normal year because summer break almost never starts on the actual first day of summer and the first day back is almost never on the first day of fall almost as if earth wasn't built for school sorry earth another physical aspect of sleeping involves time which is come to think of it not a very physical aspect but still it sort of applies because a bedtime as i've previously mentioned can help improve braining and other smart thinking things so having a good bedtime is important whether you go to bed at 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, okay, we're stretching it a bit, 12, uh, that's a bit late, 1, okay, now, are you even sleeping at that? 2, or uh, that's a bit ridiculous, 3, I feel sorry for you. And of course these times change, whether you're nocturnal or diurnal, but I think the general consensus is, if you go to bed at 3 in the morning, no matter what side of the spectrum you fall on, that's just, can't be good, unless you really don't like the first half of the day, and just want to get to the PM. Kind of strange how the two halves of the day are divided by PM and AM. In fact, I used to think that AM meant at morning, and PM meant post-morning. And turns out the actual Latin roots of those two abbreviations actually aren't too far off. So I guess for once, me thinking things actually turned out to be right. And then, if I wanted to move on from the physical aspects of sleeping, there are also some more brainy aspects, such as dreaming. And honestly, if I were to talk about dreaming, it absolutely deserves its own rant, and not to be shoved in towards the end of a previous rant that was just talking about AM and PM. Because dreaming is really a very personal subject, and can be difficult to put into words. Sort of like the word herbivorous. I thought it was herbivorous. Herbivorous? I guess it makes sense, but that's English for you. And for my fellow diurnal friends, it can be more difficult to fall asleep in the summer because of the fact that the sun is out way longer, casting all of its darn ultraviolet rays and stuff. So a good tip for falling asleep is, uh, hmm, try closing your eyes, because that makes the room darker. So I guess that's all for today. This has been Billy Natchez Rant, and I hope you enjoyed. Be responsible with bedtimes. Hello, welcome to Billy Natchez Rant. And today, we are broadcasting from a very special location. And no, it's not something fancy like Paris or California. It is the shower. And I use we in the fact that usually we is we, but we is only me today, because after all, I am in the shower. I'm surprised I wasn't smart enough to do an episode in the shower before, because after all, 
Lots of great thoughts come in the shower. I'm not exactly sure the scientific reason for that. Maybe it's because the pittering of rain just naturally makes more good the brain's functions. And a shower is pretty much just rain, but controlled, and in one cubicle. I am the master of my own droplets. Thank you. Today I wanted to talk about a cool puzzle that I learned about recently. And no, it's not a jigsaw puzzle. It's more a numerical puzzle, but not numerical in a way that's boring. In fact, it's not really much of any math. Here, I'll show you. I'll be honest, the name for this game isn't really catchy. I mean, balancing chemical equations is not particularly cool or memorable. So let's just call it an exercise in equality and numerical values. There, that's way funner. So the goal of the game is to get the same amount of chemicals on each side. And the chemicals are represented by their periodic table initials. I don't know the term. So basically here we got Zn as zinc, H as hydrogen, and Cl for chlorine. Yeah, chlorine. You know, that stuff they put in the pool that makes it hard to see underwater? It was already difficult enough to see underwater chlorine. We didn't need you for that. But we do need you for this. Considering, unfortunately, we'll have to help chlorine because all chemicals deserve equal treatment. But back on topic. The way you win the game, like I said earlier, is by getting the same amount of chemicals on each side. But you can't just switch around the chemicals willy-nilly. No. There are three rules that have to be followed. The first rule is that you have to do the metals first. And if you don't have a periodical table, it can be difficult to determine what a metal is. So basically just think, if I were building a fortress, would I use that chemical to build it out of? Like iron or gold. Those are metals. Zinc, in this equation, is the only metal. Although it's not as common as iron and gold. Because it's, you know, it's zinc. It's just zinc. Another good way to cipher out whether or not a chemical is a metal is think, would I eat this? Because generally you don't eat metals. Well, not like metallic metals. There are, of course, irons in food, but that's not the same thing. That's a different thing. Although this can be dangerous, as a general rule of thumb is don't eat anything that's just on the periodic table. And trust me, they don't even taste that good. I've tried carbon, and trust me, I've definitely had better seafood. But yes, zinc is the metal, so we will have to do it first. And the way you do it is by looking at both sides of the equal sign. If there's the same amount of zincs on each side, congratulations, you're done. And it looks like we got one zinc on the left, one zinc on the right. Congratulations, step one is done. Easy game. Now I should take the time to introduce an important game mechanic called subscripts. See that tiny two after chlorine and that second hydrogen? Those are called subscripts. They are permanent numbers attached to chemicals that basically just means, hey, there are that many of these chemicals. Instead of having to write out CLCL, CL, you can just put CL with a little 2. Instead of having to write H H H H H H H H H, you can just write H with uh, however many times I just said H. The last two rules are pretty much the same rule, just split into two. So rule number two is that next you do non-metals, which, as the name implies, are chemicals that are not metals. So that would be hydrogen and chlorine. But wait, there's a special exception. If you do hydrogen or oxygen during step two, the entire thing will be wrong. Don't ask why. Confront your local stoichiometrist about what the heck is happening here, because I don't know. All I know is that you save hydrogen and oxygen for last. Or else a black hole will envelop your neighborhood. And of course I had to choose the worst example for a first problem, because there is a hydrogen and non-metal grouped right up next to each other. But whatever. Let's just do it. So the way you do it is by dividing it up into chunks. I noticed that on the left side of the equal sign there is one hydrogen and one chlorine. But on the right, there are two chlorines and two hydrogens. Uh-oh. What are we going to do about that? The way to know which sections of the field you can work on are that you can divide them up into boxes, like I did here. Boxes are separated by equal signs or plus signs. Zinc is in a box, hydrogen and chlorine are in a box, zinc and two chlorines are in a box, and two hydrogens are in a box by themselves. Which brings up another very strange and seemingly random game mechanic, which is, if there's one hydrogen by itself, you automatically put a subscript too. Because, uh, I don't know. By this stage in the game, our actions are only multiplication. We can only multiply boxes to reach the amount on the other side. So that first box with zinc is pretty inconsequential, considering that the zincs are already balanced. The second box, however, is where we're actually going to do the work, because there's one hydrogen and one chlorine. And that side only needs one more hydrogen and one more chlorine in order to be balanced. But considering we can only multiply, that would mean that the solution, two. The solution is two. So you put a giant two right next to the hydrogen and chlorine, which would then multiply them by two and result in an equal amount of stuff on each side. The big numbers are called coefficients, by the way which is a rather unfitting name, because usually when something's co, it's inferior, like a co-pilot. But obviously, this two is the supreme overlord of twos, because that is a pretty big two. I'm sorry, was that not fulfilling? Were you not entertained? I just taught you reaction stoichiometry. That's not interesting enough? 
You expected my shower thoughts to be anything other than reactions to archaeometry? Well, in that case, I apologize. Here are some more traditional shower thoughts that you may enjoy instead. Because of the fact that all the systems of the body are working constantly every day, that makes multitasking an exclusively external ability, because otherwise there wouldn't be a point to call it multitasking. It would just be an additional task to the tasks that are already being tasked by your own self. When a girl says that she's going out with her girlfriends, it is most likely to be implied that she is going out with her companions, who are also girls. But when a boy says that he's going out with his boyfriends, it is most likely to be interpreted as a romantic endeavor, despite the fact that girlfriend and boyfriend in any other context mean the exact same thing. The strength scaling for small insects is incredibly off, because people always say that spider silk is the strongest stuff in the world, or that an ant is one of the most powerful animals because it can lift like 20 times its body weight or something, despite it weighing one milligram. This normally wouldn't be a problem, as it would mean that almost every single animal would have their strength scaling decreased purely because of the existence of hippopotamuses and lions and stuff, but it becomes a problem when those scholastic animal versus animal books say that an ant would beat a rhinoceros, which is just strictly not true. Nobody knows who the last person to know about something is, because if you inquired about it, then they would know about it. The shower is not only a place to come up with goofy little factoids like those, but also a place where you can confess any secrets you want, because no one can hear you over that pittering rain. Sometimes when I wear socks, I wear two pairs of socks on the same foot to protect the sock underneath if it's being close to being ripped. One of my favorite drinks is orange juice and chocolate shosh. My real birthday is on February 29th, but I've never told anyone else before. But uh, yeah, remember to take science and do showers all the time. And uh, this has been Billy Netto's Rant, and I hope you enjoyed. Hello, welcome to Billy Netto's Rant, which is a thing that I really shouldn't still have to say after three years, but it's still fun to say, so I'll say it anyway. Today, I actually have a small bit of scratch news. Yes, that's a thing that doesn't happen often, because Scratch is a mysterious and timid creature that only pounces at the most inopportune times, and then apologizes for pouncing, while at the same time denying that it ever pounced in the first place. As previously stated, a self-repairing website that seems to be sentient, and focused on being as unusual as possible. But today, it seems that they are making a change that will make the website less unusual. As, in a giant, and I mean giant, this thing takes up the entire screen, green word box on the front page, they are apparently going to add an option for a high contrast color scheme for the code blocks, which is to make them easier to see by putting black text on a more pastel colored block instead of the usual, arguably abysmal, white text on a saturated block. Which, if I didn't know what all the blocks already meant, I can understand why some people might have trouble reading them. So I think this is a good idea, considering this is likely the only time I will ever get to speak about this feature, and the only time I would ever like to speak about this feature, because the last time I talked about a major quote-unquote major, it wasn't really that big, changed to Scratch, was that time when they changed the studios, which was like, a year ago? It was a long time ago. And everyone was divided about that, and I made two episodes about it, one saying it was good, and then the other one displaying the other side of the argument. I don't think I'm gonna have to do that this time, because simply put, the Pestel thing is an option that can be switched on and off, while the studio thing wasn't. But hey, the studio thing also wasn't that big a deal, because do you hear anyone talking about it today? No, that's because no one cares. Everyone accepts that this is the new studio, and we just moved on. But that got me thinking about color palettes. They also said that they're going to make the blue bar at the top of the homepage pink or purple instead of blue, which is like, okay. I don't really see the point of changing that, but purple's cool. Anyway, all that hullabaloo got me thinking about pastels and color and color palettes and how color can change the feel of things. Because as I said before, the difference between a saturated color and a pastel color is pretty big. The saturated colors tend to look more juicy, I'd say, and pastel colors look more soft, less violent. And by violent, I mean bright. Because we all know how violent lights are. Uh, oh yeah, color and violence, that's what I wanted to talk about. So, around the same time that that new studio thing happened, I talked about Doom 64, and I talked about, you know, like, the gameplay of that game. Which is fine and good, but today, I want to talk about something different. And by something different, I mean, I want to say one thing about that game and then move on to something else. Because Doom 64 also has a certain colory art style, which I'd say I'd describe it as gothic castle laser tag arena. And there, that's all I wanted to say about Doom 64 and color palettes. Really just, you know, it has a color palette, which is really all I had to say just to somewhat segue into this very funny thing I forgot to mention last time. And that is that Doom 64 has a particular font choice that can make some letters blend together. And well, well, I think you'll all appreciate what I'm about to show you. Jelly, would you be so kind as to pull up the screenshot? 
Research lab a anished. Boring statistics. Entering, uh, <laughs> entering anal outpost. Now, I will give Doom 64 some credit, as it is one of the few uh, action games from the 90s to attempt to teach the player about the importance of the final part of the digestive system, but this level title just brings itself to many questions about what the actual level itself contains. Now, it could be implied that anal outpost is simply a misinterpretation of final outpost, but it also brings up a new moral question about the game. Perhaps the demons at that point just gave up fighting the Doom guy and instead wanted to teach him <laughs> about, bi about biology. Although, unfortunately, none of those explanations can explain the level in the Lost Levels expansion pack for Doom 64, titled <laughs> titled Final Judgment. I can now understand what, how Doom 64 was going for a more horror approach to the idea, because I too find <laughs> Final Judgment quite scary. Now, I understand that this game is all about blowing up demons and destroying them. However, I am very glad that there is no level titled Final Destruction. You know what? No. Deep breath. This is a mature show where we discuss mature things and mature topics, such as... Uh, but let's talk about something else for a second, uh, like this new background palette. You might have noticed it. It changed when I switched back from that screenshot that said, uh, well, it said something that we won't talk about anymore. And uh, as you can clearly see, the colors in the background have gotten a lot lighter and a bit smoother. They contrast more with me and Jelly, who by comparison look darker and more saturated. And that's because we've always been like this, but just against a more saturated and bright background, it's difficult to tell the true saturatosity. That is the idea that the Scratch team was going through when they thought of these new pastel color blocks. Think of us as the letters in the background as well, uh, the background. It's easier to distinguish me and her from the background when the background is pastel and we are bright and easy to see. So what did we learn today? Well, we learned that pastel and more saturated color palettes can clash together in a fun and readable way. I also mentioned one thing about Doom 64. Count it, one thing. Because that other thing I mentioned has nothing to do with Doom 64, because Doom 64 does not have a level titled that. It has a level titled Final Outpost, and that is the final thing that I'm going to say about that. And now, my favorite part of the episode. The episode that I've been finally waiting for this entire time. This has been Billy Nitro's Rant, and hope you enjoyed. <laughs>
and not that it just infers everything. But let's see what the third point is. Exclamation points on road signs make drivers aware of hidden dangers. What? That has nothing to do with exclamation points in literature. Although I guess it never specified in literature. But usually a road sign doesn't have any words. It just has a giant symbol of something with an X through it. So yeah, I agree with these points a little bit. But I also don't agree because I think almost all of the points are ridiculous and not really about the subject at hand. But I can understand where I can understand. I can undersee where they're coming from. Undersee? No. I can understand where they're coming from. As they do support me and their support of exclamation points. But let's see what the three reasons are that exclamation points are not necessary. After all, I am quite intrigued in this topic. Let's see, point number one. Exclamation points make the writer seem desperate, and even like they're shouting at the reader. Well, I suppose if the story was being written in second person, that would be true. But most stories are written in first and third, in which case the yelling would be at another character, and not the actual reader. And also, if you wanted to convey screaming, I find typing in all caps more effective than just an exclamation point anyway, because the word AWESOME with a period is just like, oh, that's awesome. The word AWESOME with an exclamation point, that's a bit more awesome. The word AWESOME, all in caps, bold, and in size 20 font with an exclamation point. Now that is truly awesome. Point number two, readers don't want to be told how to feel. They should be allowed to interpret the writing on their own. Well, yes, but I don't think adding an extra line on top of your period is going to change that much. And finally, point number three, the skill of writing is in crafting words and sentences that carry emotion. I also agree, but I still don't see what exclamation points take away from that. You can write a good story with just exclamation points. Just look at most comic books. You can even write a good story without any punctuation at all. For example, some poems. And seeing as this magazine is written for kids, after all, some kids may not understand what an exclamation point is. So let's see the three things you need to know before trying to debate this topic section. Number one, exclamation points are used when an interjection or exclamation. Wow, really? Like, watch out! They're also used at the end of a sentence to express significance or strong emotion. A thing that we will ignore and demonize for the rest of the article by saying that emotion does not belong in writing, but that emotion also does, does absolutely belong in writing. The exclamation point first appeared by, in writing about 600 years ago and is believed to come from the Latin word spelled I-O, which means joy. After the adaptation of the Latin word spelled I-O, this forever changed the tone of Old MacDonald's farm. Old MacDonald had a farm! E-I-E-I-O! Exclamation points are sometimes called bangs, shriekers, gaspers, and screamers by journalists, writers, and publishers. I've never heard any of those things, and they all sound dumb, and also, we do not need to know that in order to debate this article. One last word for this magazine before we continue. At the bottom it says, The goal of the big debate is to present two sides on an issue fairly in order to stimulate discussion and allow our readers to make up their minds. The views on these pages do not reflect those of The Week Junior, and the page is not funded by third parties. Well, if it doesn't reflect your opinion, then why are you even writing it? I can definitely agree that they did a good job balancing the two arguments, as I disagree with both of them and think that they're both dumb. So yes, what is my stance on exclamation points? Are they necessary? Should they be eradicated? My answer is absolutely not. Exclamation points are a staple in the writer's repertoire, and if someone doesn't want to use them, then they cannot use them. There's no need to ruin the shift one of everyone else just because you don't enjoy it. Let's give one final example as to why exclamation points are just as necessary as any other punctuation. For example, a character says, what are you doing? With a period, that could be interpreted as, what are you doing? As in the character doesn't exactly care what the other is doing, but rather that they're just sort of mildly interested. What are you doing? With a question mark, can be read as such. What are you doing? That is to imply that the asker has a bit more enthusiasm and legitimacy to what they're asking and what they're doing. What are you doing? With an exclamation point can be read as such because of the stronger emotion being conveyed by the exclamation point. They are probably very concerned. And finally, what are you doing? With two exclamation points and two question marks in alternating order is the most effective way to convey strong emotion without using all capital letters or any sort of other font trickery. What was the point of me talking about this theoretical debate in a children's magazine? Well, the point was that it's a learning experience and I hope that I've taught some people more about the exclamation point usage. Maybe the next time you go to write a creative writing essay in school, you can use a few more exclamation points. Maybe put five in a row so it looks like a barcode. Go buy some strawberries. And also, according to the Week Junior's big debate section on their website, 95% of people said that exclamation points were necessary, and only 5% said no. So yeah, this whole debate was sort of pointless for me to talk about if the vast majority of people already know the importance of exclamation points. But whatever. I had fun, and you might have had fun, if you're still watching by this point. So let's just draw a big capital C over this tic-tac-toe board and call it even.
This has been Billy Net Joe's rant, and I hope you enjoyed exclamation point. Hello, welcome to Billy Net Joe's rant, and today I will yet again be attempting to answer a question that nobody has ever asked before because it's fun. Today's mystery is yet again presented by the game Doom. And I swear, I'm not running out of ideas. It's just that a lot of similar ideas are coming to me all at the same time before more diverse ones do. And the sooner we get through those similar ideas, the quicker we can get on to more unique ones. But I promise you, this mystery is quite unique, as it does not involve the predominant hand of the main character. It rather instead involves something that that character uses with their main hands. To make a long story short, the most recent addition in the Doom franchise, Doom Eternal, decided to take a step back and revert most of the characters and items to their original, classic designs. The same is true with the plasma rifle in that game. They devolved it from its previous form as a slick, sort of white, plasticky, stormtrooper-looking laser cannon, and instead reverted it back to its weird, springy, coil, bouncy rubber hose form that goes boing, except they removed the boing sound, because obviously that was too cool for Doom Eternal. And of course, everyone knows the plasma cannon as that very uniquely shaped item that vibrates back and forth and fires a purple stream of lasers, right? Well, obviously, that's what Doom Eternal thought, because that's exactly how the weapon works in Doom Eternal, minus the boing. Obviously, I'd trust the people who make the game to accurately recreate a creation from a previous one of their games, right? Well, what if I told you that the plasma rifle never shot purple at all? Hmm. Because Eternal seems pretty sure that the original plasma gun shot purple, right? For those who are unfamiliar with Doom, here is the BPCB in question. Now, if we take a look at the BPCB, we can see that at the very center, it's quite obviously white and there are some rays of light, perhaps reflecting off of the white part, and then it expands into a quite obviously blue shell. So it gives off blue light, but is the projectile blue, or is it actually that more lavender color that's on the inside? Because of the way that the game is designed, the BPCB can only ever be seen by one angle, because the game uses 2D sprites in a 3D environment. So you might say, okay, that doesn't really help us at all. Are those blue lines actually part of the projectile, or are they just, like, light bending and shining in our eyes? Well, I think that it actually is light to being emitted and not the actual color of the projectile. Because if you were to shoot a missile, you could then walk in front of the missile and see the front of the missile. So I believe that that same concept is being applied to the plasma ball in the fact that it's a completely spherical orb of some indeterminate color, low on the rainbow, that just so happens to be quite shiny. And the shininess is what you see when it's being shot. It seems Doom wanted to keep this a mystery for quite some time, because in Doom 64, the next Doom game that used different graphics, you can clearly see they changed the plasma ball to be more blue. They also made the plasma cannon way less effective, but that's an argument for a different day. Compared to the lavenderness of the BPCB, the D64P sucks is certainly far bluer. I went ahead and did a little bit of Billy science, and I color picked almost every single color, I may have missed one or two, from the plasma ball. And as you can see, the colors are, as I determine them, by using Scratch's built-in color selector, white, purple, purple, blue, blue, purple, blue, purple. So there are an even amount of blues and purples. Eat your heart out, fandom wiki, for saying that the plasma ball is blue and white. You obviously don't know what you're talking about. But now to seriously answer the question, was Doom Eternal correct in portraying the plasma ball as entirely purple and white? Well, if it's what's on the inside that counts, yes, because the plasma ball on the inside is absolutely purple. But as it expands, it gets more and more blue which could be some sort of clever metaphor for capitalism, but I highly doubt that. As you can see, if we remove any traces of blue from the BPCB, you can see that it is mostly a lavender purple. Nowhere near the more saturated, aggressive purple used in Doom Eternal, but yes, technically Doom Eternal was correct in portraying the BPCB as purple. Just, you know, only partially. Either color would have worked, because it's about 50% purple and 50% blue. Ah, crumbs, I just disproved my own thesis. I said that it never shot purple in the first place, and then proved that the plasma ball is purple. You know what? Forget theses. I didn't say anything. This isn't an essay for high school. I don't need a thesis. I don't need to prove it in four paragraphs or less. I don't need a conclusion, even. Although a conclusion that could be drawn from this is... So yeah, the plasma ball may be white, or blue, or purple, or whatever, but the real question is... How come when the spider enemies in the game shoot plasma, it's green? And how come all the plasma pickups in the game also show green energy inside? Is this energy specifically made for the BFG? Does the plasma cannon somehow undistill the concentrated BFG balls? Is green hotter than purple? Or blue, for that matter? If my previous theory is true, then how do arachnotrons have the power to shoot something as the caliber of a BFG, if they get disintegrated by one that's shot by me? 
These are the questions. These are the questions that will never have an answer. However, I did my darndest trying to answer the ones I could. If there's one lesson to learn from this, it's that who you are on the inside is more important than who you are on the outside. Because who you are on the inside will be more accurately represented in Doom Eternal, and can kill demons more effectively. I love wholesome endings. Hmm, I wonder where Jelly was tonight. I think she would have enjoyed this. She loves purple. And laser death to demon scum. I hope she's okay. Hello, welcome to Billy Net Joe's Rant, quite a special episode. Today we are broadcasting from none other than Jelly's bedroom, a place that I have never been in. I've never even been in her house before. But I felt bad that I so often invite her to my house while never checking out hers. And it turns out it is quite cool. Both literally and also literally. Because she has an air conditioner. And seeing as it is over 100 degrees outside, today's subject is not about sublimination and its effects on young animals. It is about statues. Neither of the things I just said are related. Though I suppose if you wanted a juxtaposification on why I chose to talk about statues today, well, uh, I like talking about art things, and I'm not sure I covered statues. Maybe in passing. Maybe I mentioned The Thinker once. But everyone thought about The Thinker at least once. It's a given. Unfortunately, there is no statue called The Giver. There is a, a book, though. The most famous statue I can think of right off the top of my head that has, strangely enough, the word statue in it, because it doesn't really have an official title, is the Statue of Liberty. Now, most statues, they have some sort of fancy name in, like, Greek or Latin or something. And I'm sure the Statue of Liberty had a fancy name in French, but I don't know it. Because it just goes by Statue of Liberty. Which is fine. It's pretty big. Cool. Minty. Very fresh statue. It's nice to swish your mouth with it after brushing your teeth. And the Statue of Liberty, I learned recently in a school assignment where I had to, like, research the Statue of Liberty, is that it actually has, like, shackles on its feet. And that's to symbolize, like, breaking free of bad things or something. I don't remember. It was a while ago. And I think that's quite interesting. Because usually when you see the Statue of Liberty, you see the, the tome thing and the torch. You don't usually look down at the feet. Because I assume you can't see them from ground level. And if you're all the way up at the top, then you're too far away to see them. Although I appreciate when people put little details like that and like, metaphors. I'm also sure the amount of spikes on her crown are also a metaphor but I, I don't care enough to research it. The second statue that comes to my mind is the Venus de Milo, which I assume means something in some language, but it's a statue of the Greek god Aphrodite, also known as Venus, like the planet. Yeah. But unfortunately, the statue is not actually of the planet, but rather the person the planet was named after, which is quite disappointing. And the most notable thing about the statue is that it doesn't have any arms, or a shirt, but it does wear, like, a towel. But, I mean, everyone in Greece wore towels, so that's not really interesting or notable. But I was trying to research, why doesn't the Aphrodite de Milo have arms? Because it seems like an important thing to sculpt. But then, I learned that the statue originally did have arms, and that they just broke off, because the statue is super old, which I guess makes sense. I'm sure there are lots of other statues that are destroyed beyond recognition that we might not even know. The rock you could have been sitting on while eating ice cream yesterday? That could have been... The Neptune de Milo. Who knows? So yeah, there wasn't actually an artistic reason why she doesn't have any arms. It's just poor handling. Another notable statue I think of often is one called the Statue of Unity. Which, yeah, right there. There's another statue that just has statue in its name. But this one is not in the United States. It's actually in India. And it's notable for being the tallest statue in the world of a person. By a large margin. This thing keeps the Statue of Liberty as a pet. That's how tall the sculpture is. The actual sculpture itself depicts an Indian Prime Minister who has been dead for over 70 years. But I'm sure he's very proud that his actions have been memorated, commemorated in a humongous figure overlooking the country. And I think this statue should be more recognized because with its massive height, powerful presence, and relative landlockedness, because unlike the Statue of Liberty, this thing isn't on the, an island in the middle of nowhere, this thing is pretty darn close to land. So if I were taking my weekly drive through Gujarat, India, and I saw a giant man over the horizon, I'd be pretty alarmed. Which is why I think it's important to raise awareness of the Statue of Unity. I'm sure that Prime Minister is also very honored that he now has the world's best posture, as not many people have a spine made of rebar, 
or a view that good. Another very notable thing about this statue is that it was actually built in five years, relatively recently. It was finished in 2018 and started in 2013. I thought that building giant statues of people was a thing of the past, but apparently, no. Other notable statues include the Colossus of Rhodes, which, unlike Venus de Milo, was in much worse condition, as in the fact that it's pretty much gone now. Completely gone, as in it's not there. How unfortunate. I've heard talk over the years of people wanting to propose that they rebuild the thing, but it doesn't really seem to be going anywhere in those proposals, seeing as it still is not built. But I don't really think that you always need a solid reason to build a giant statue. Can't the solid reason just be that giant statues look cool? I mean, if your state is big enough to allow a giant statue to be constructed, then I say, what the heck, build a giant statue. It may cost a few million dollars, but you're a state. You spend millions of dollars every day. Why not spend it on a cool statue? Despite the fact that the Colossus of Rhodes stands near water, thus making it technically the Colossus of Rhode Island, this has no relation to that one specific small U.S. state that has never held a Super Bowl. It would be more specific to call it the Colossus of Rhodes Peninsula, really. Rhodes Harbor, Rhodes Bay, or just Rhodes if you want. Although now I guess they could call it the Statue of E. Rhodes. No? No one? That's not funny? Okay, whatever. Other more famous statues include the Statue of Christ the Redeemer in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, which I don't want to focus on too much because everyone already knows about this one. It's the giant man putting his arms out on top of that big hill in Brazil. And I'm sorry, Statue of Unity, but I'm pretty sure he has a better view than you. And that's the hard thing about life as a statue. Wherever you're pointed, that's where you're going to be pointed forever. I suppose technically a statue could be mechanized, but that would be too close to giant robots, which are an entirely different subject. Ooh, I should write that down. Talk about giant robots later. That would be cool. Let's see, what else could I talk about? The, hmm, the Moai Island heads? No, I've, I've absolutely talked about those before. Uh, the Statue of David? No, that's just a more naked version of Venus de Milo. But a dude. Is that the one who was wearing the cap, or was that the thinker? Hmm, I'm gonna have to think about that one. Uh, there's also the statue of Atlas. Not Atlas as in, like, the map. Atlas as in the guy. Which I'm starting to realize that a lot of words have people related to them. Strange. So yeah, the statue of Atlas. It's in, uh, New York, I think. And it's, a uh, it's a guy holding up a... A bunch of rings that are in the shape of the Earth. Because of the... The story of Atlas, where he held up the Earth for some reason I don't remember. I don't know, you can see it in the intro of 30 Rock. It's just... And I think it was a good idea for structural integrity to make the Earth not completely solid. Because I'm not sure they had that technology in the 30s. I'm always surprised with sculptors. They seem to make really detailed sculptures, even in times where they didn't have the technology to do so efficiently. I mean, the Statue of Atlas was only built 17 PG. That's like 100 years ago. <sighs> this AC is making me woozy. I don't want to talk about statues anymore. I'm tired. I think I'm gonna go to bed. And I think this has been Billy Nature's Rant, and I hope you enjoyed.